Uh, our next session today is titled The Poet in Society, and we have uh, four poets who need absolutely no introduction. Uh, we have Jeet Tail, Sadaf Saz, Tishani Doshi, and K. Shilata, and they'll be in conversation with each other. So good afternoon. I hope this hall fills up a little bit more. It's a warm afternoon, but I hope that happens. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this lovely panel of com uh, consisting of Jeet Tail, Tishani Doshi, and Sadaf Saz, poets whom I personally admire and poets who have enjoyed the attention and admiration of the world. The common belief about poetry, of course, uh, which is perhaps the reason so few take to writing it, is that it does not sell, that nobody reads it, that poetry is fated to remain marginal, at least in the subcontinent. In fact, I remember a senior colleague of mine at IIT who retired some years ago, telling me when I said that I write poetry, why do you bother writing something that is such a minor genre? You know, those, that phrase stuck in my head, you know, all these years it scarred me in a sense. So I'm really glad it's especially a pleasure to have an all poet panel um, here today. Um, in Jeet's book, um, Book of Chocolate Sa Saints, there is this journalist character, Subir Sunalkar, who talks about uh, why there is a, how there is a reason why the words poetry and poverty sound so similar and uh, sound as well as are spelt similarly, right? Perhaps there is something to be said for the theory. If it is hard to make a living as a writer of fiction, it is nearly impossible to live off your poetry. And yet, there's always a group of people somewhere uh, in various parts of the world, who read poetry, who define themselves by it, who angle themselves perhaps in society in relation to poetry. And that gives me cause for hope. And I tell myself that perhaps numbers do not really matter so much. It is really the quality of attention we bring to our reading and to our writing of uh, poetry. So here we are to discuss the role of the poet in society, which is a very grand, large, daunting theme. And I don't quite know how we're going to sort of go about this. Uh, so we'll try and perhaps break it up into bits and pieces that we can then sink our teeth uh, into. And we'll have a couple of rounds of questions uh, interwoven with which there will be uh, readings by the poets. So you will get to hear their work and uh, see how that sounds. So Tishani, I'll uh, begin with you. I read you somewhat whimsical poem, opening poem, Contract, in your collection, The Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. Uh, so less whimsically, what sort of contract do you envisage yourself? as having with, um, with your readers, with society, if one may use the word. Do you operate with a palpable sense of society? And how do you work through the facelessness of what you call the reader or what you call society? I'm also thinking of your very powerful poem, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods, which I've seen you perform so beautifully. And if you'd like to read from that, it'd be lovely. Hi, everyone. Uh, so the, the first poem in the book is called Contract. And the reason I wrote that poem is because I woke up one morning uh, in a very irritating, uh, irritated mood because a mosquito was buzzing in my ear and waking me up. And uh, to me, it seemed the perfect metaphor for what the poet does, which is my job and our job in a way, which is to constantly be there buzzing in your ear and hoping that someone will listen. I think. To me, the biggest challenge to be a poet is to find the audience. And increasingly, what I felt is that we've had to put ourselves out more uh, to do readings, to go into areas where we wouldn't normally go, um, and make people listen to poetry. Because I think a lot of people have an idea that poetry is somehow not for them, that it's difficult, or that it's I don't know, there's something inaccessible about it. Maybe it's the way it's taught in schools. It's hard to say, but there's a, there's a point at which everybody loves poetry, and then suddenly, for some people, it stays, and then for other people, it's gone forever. And I think my um, sort of evangelical mode for the last few years as a poet has been to try and find that reader who doesn't know, but I know, that they need poetry. So. So do you like to read also from Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods? Here? Sure. Um, maybe I'll read that poem, and then I can read the other one later, because so since I'm talking about it. So this poem is called Contract. Dear reader, I agree to turn my skin inside out, to reinvent every lost word, to burnish, 
to steal, to do what I must in order to singe your lungs. I will forego happiness, stab myself repeatedly and lower my head into countless ovens. I will fade backwards into the future and tell you what I see. If it is bleak, I will lie so that you may live seized with wonder. If it is miraculous, I will send messages in your dreams and they will flicker as a silvered cottage in the woods choked with vines of moonflower. Don't kill me, reader. This neck has been working for years to harden itself against the axe. This body, meager as it is, has lost so many limbs to wars, so many eyes and hearts to romance. But love me, and I will follow you everywhere, to the dusty corners of childhood, to every downfall and resurrection, till your skin becomes my skin. Let us be twins, our blood thumping after each other like thunder and lightning. And when you put your soft head down to rest, dear reader, I promise to always be there, humming in the dungeons of your auditory canals, an immortal mosquito hastening you towards fury, towards incandescence. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Tishan. And so it's a kind of a pact with the reader. I'm, I'm saying that poetry has always been there and poetry will always be there. And the role of the poet is to remind you that poets can do something that other people can't. And so it's that, that buzzing, that, that constant um, presence of how poetry can change your life, if you let it. Sad of, um you do a multiplicity of uh, things, you know, you wear many hats, you're, a, an, you're an advocate for women's rights, you're a cultural activist, an entrepreneur, you also curate the Dhaka Literary Festival and you're a poet, right? So there's a sort of a series of ands in a sense. Um, how does the fact of your being a poet, the particular sensibility that um, poetry uh, requires perhaps, resonate with the rest of what you do and what's your contract like with society? I think poetry for me uh, is, is, is my own way of dealing with uh, the multitude of bombardment of different emotions I feel and it, it's kind of my response to dealing with uh, I think the madness we're in. Um, and the other thing is I think that you know I, I try and use different mediums I think to touch people and to um, I guess convey not only sort of what is going on around us but also connect emotionally to other people and, and I think that somehow poetry can sort of connect to people in a way that maybe a very sort of well thought out non-fiction article or uh, lecture um, doesn't do. So if you could also um, maybe read from your poem, I really liked Tickly and Glass Bangles from your collection Sari Dreams, but if there is something else that you would like to read please. Oh, okay, I'll just, I'll read that because it's, uh, it's quite an old, oh, there you are, I actually opened it on the page. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is um, a poem I wrote quite a long time ago. Uh, uh, I grew up in the UK and uh, moved to live in Bangladesh. Um, didn't move back, moved there when I was uh, 16. Uh, and uh, I kind of wrote that uh, just a few years after sort of around that time when I was probably 16, 17, so a long time ago. Tickly and glass bangles. With tickly and glass bangles, a swish of archel with sandal toe, secured in this jigsaw web as pieces come and go. Am I in too deep? Sometimes not at all. Red bar, zari edge, black shades and all. Untamed as sweat glistens, a shake of tangle with jet mane. I've awoken again, 
to the destiny I foresaw, the dream that I bore. To many who had glimpsed the black and white prints, bear a chronicle of sorts. Yes, I've emerged with uncaught gushing froth, cutting energy raw, stamping my horizons and others I saw with askance parda eyes and dormant riches within. I enveloped floating worlds till chains became rings and freedom another space as the wilderness grew, I with it too. Yes, I've ridden cotton clouds from strength, driven by the call, black denim, boot lace, raw silk and all. Thank you, Sarah. So, Jeet, in the preface to your collected uh, poems, you talk about how uh, these errors are correct. Is the last full-length collection you think you will publish, right? And you also talk about the fact that now you're 55, the time, time itself is now an enemy rather than uh, a friend. And towards the end, you make this very interesting uh, remark. You say, this is my life, these are my collected poems. There is nothing collected about any of it. Made me smile because that's how I think of my life also. Perhaps many of us do. Um, which led me to also think uh, that there really isn't anything collected about any poet or perhaps any human being. So to be a poet especially is to be particularly uncollected, right? So given this, how does one even begin to think about poetry and society and the contract with society and, and all of that? That's about five questions right there. Um, yeah, well, before I get to that, I'd just like to say the, uh, the poetry and poverty thing that you mentioned from um, Book of Chocolate Saints, um, it struck me that all the letters that you use in poetry appear in poverty except for the letter V, you know, which if you pronounce in the Indian way is we poets on stage. Uh, so it just struck me as something, you know, that I was just surprised nobody else had pointed it out. I thought I should do it quickly before it's done. Uh, the idea of poets living collected lives, you know, the, the cliched phrase that we always hear is calm, cool and collected. And then when you think of a book of collected poems, you realize that uh, a book of collected poems really has nothing to do with the idea of calmness and coolness and collectedness. Poets are, uh, you know, there is some truth to the cliché about poets. Uh, there's always truth to clichés, but certainly when it comes to poets, there is some truth to the cliché that uh, they live scattered, um, reckless lives. So uh, I just felt that the idea of or the, the phrase collected poems was a, a kind of a misnomer. Would you like to read uh, from the collection? No, but I will. Please do. <laughs> I was thinking I'd read something called Self-Portrait, which is also a, a very early poem and a kind of a, it's also a contract with a reader. But instead, I'm going to read something called The Opposite of Nostalgia. I'm trying to forget those days one day at a time. The pitiful rooms with their puddles of light. The women I haggled with. The car stopped in the street. The wife barefoot on the run. Car keys in her hand. Or I'm there, the sum of my ambition defined by old rage. My anger like a slow child hitting out at anyone who comes her way. I'm thinking of the negotiation with strangers, the attempt to say things differently, the men's room at the airport, the glassine bag, the rolled up note, the line hitting the back of my throat with a kick like an anesthetic, and later the paramedic saying I'm lucky to be alive and telling him he's wrong, I'm not lucky or alive, just high. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeet. Um, Tishani, I, your poem, Everyone Loves a Dead Girl, I really felt a connect with that, uh, especially I think the image of uh, 
people braiding their daughter's hair and imagining that they could be secured thus, right? Perhaps it's because I did this. I used to braid my daughter's hair for years and now she doesn't let me do it anymore. Um, so these are the lines, the last lines. Truly they believe themselves when they say the world is a forest, darling. Remember the breadcrumbs, remember to dig a tunnel home through the rain. I find these lines unforgettable, incredibly tender, and they speak to our vulnerability as human beings, which is perhaps also one of the things that poems ought to do for a reader. So is it important, would you think, given the weightiness of our theme this afternoon, to hold that kind of tenderness and sentimentality in check, or is tenderness the weapon of poetry? No, I think we need to remember tenderness. Um, I was thinking about the theme and one of the things, you know, poetry has been through so many uh, movements and I think one of the things is against forgetfulness so that we work as a kind of witness, but also to reinstate things like beauty, like tenderness, because as Sadaf said, and I think as, as Jeet would agree, we, we, we write in order to arrive somewhere else, to, to make sense of the craziness around, the craziness inside, and the poem is a way to make a bridge. Um, this particular poem that you were talking about, you know, I, I, a, a very dear friend of mine was murdered, and so this whole idea of uh, violence against women, which is a big part of this book, um, has been on my mind for years and years and years, and um, I think about the way that women are portrayed in fairy tales, so it also has that Hansel and Gretel, you know, the, the, the breadcrumbs. And the idea, of course, in this country of how we think that by securing our daughters and by keeping them at home, that they might somehow be safe. Um, which is not true because my friend was in her apartment when she was murdered. And so there is the idea of safety itself is a false one. And the idea that you can do some magic trick to survive is also a false one. And so I think in this case for me, the poem is a way to negotiate that sense of horror. I'm not a parent, but I am a daughter and I can understand that fear and, and as a woman also how we move through so I mean those are all just some of the things I, I, I think about when I'm writing and I don't know then the poem stands by itself for other people to bring their interpretations to it. Uh, Sadaf I was um, particularly interested in your monologue I think which you have uh, based on the experiences of Bangladeshi women which you have performed in many places uh, it's called Ja kotha jaina bola. Ja kotha ja jaina, jaina bola. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay, that which cannot be said, right? So I, want, I was wondering if you would speak a little bit about that work and also about your work as a women's rights advocate. What is it that you do? That was an, uh, a very uh, personal project for me. I mean, I took part in the first ever uh, uh, performance of uh, Eve Ensler's Vagina Mollocks in Dhaka. Um, and I remember being absolutely terrified doing it because I felt that, <laughs> you know, sort of having worked as a women's advocate and sort of being quite vocal for many years, I was really terrified to put myself out there uh, beyond my comfort zone and kind of, you know, um, scared of perhaps a fatwa coming on my head or people just not taking me seriously anymore, um, you know, kind of losing my credibility. Uh, then I thought that there's so many women that I talk to every single day and we can work with very intimately all over Bangladesh uh, that I'm asking to go beyond their comfort zone and how dare I not go beyond my comfort zone when I'm wanting to start to talk about sexuality and violence um, and what goes on at, in the home and on a very personal level. Uh, so having performed, you know, and, and I remember we first put on the vagina monologues um, uh, in, a, in, a, in an all women's kind of uh, environment um, and just had a blast because we said words that we've never said in public before in, in Bangladesh. Um, so it was amazing. And then this, the next day, it was kind of um, people that we knew, but men in the audience. Um, but I remember being extremely embarrassed, sort of talking about seeing my vagina in the mirror in front of like people who I knew socially. Um, and so, uh, but then um, 
I thought that we needed, it, it, that was in English and it was a certain type of audience. Um, so we collected together and I, we've got a, an amazing network of women's organizations, women's led organizations from all 64 districts that we've been working with for years. Um, and so we collected together about sort of 60 case studies, case studies, different uh, narratives of women's lives. Um, and um, I wrote uh, about 15 monologues uh, in English, but then I kind of translated them to Bangla with a friend. Uh, and we got people from outside Dhaka, young women, to perform them. And they did such an amazing job, so much so that people felt that it was their story. Uh, and it was life-changing for them because their biggest reaction was, uh, now we know that there are women we can go to if something happens to us. Uh, and the other eye-opener was we were, you know, there was a lesbian woman. So it was, it was positive and negative. It was not not as vagina-based as vagina monologues, but certainly talking beyond our comfort zone. And I, I think that was the second part, part that I was pretty terrified that we would get a very strong reaction because we put it on in small um, towns in Bangladesh um, and, and really got an amazing response. Because I think you're connecting to the emotional because the, the monologues, I think, were quite poetic as well. Jeet, I was thinking of your poem, Dear Editor, in which you talk about the reasons that you like writing sonnets. And you say, you start with a line and follow it through. The sonnet writes the sonnet, not you. Right? So it describes a state where the poet, let me use this mumbo jumbo term, where the poet is a medium. right? And there isn't a consciousness of agency or uh, anything. But on the other hand, there is this very heavy expectation, even this afternoon's theme, that poet should be somehow you know, some kind of consciousness raisers and so on. So, uh, would you like to say something about that? You know, I, I, I mean, I think uh, the name of this session um, was uh, put together by somebody who was in a hurry, uh, who had maybe five minutes to come up with a title. And if they had put in maybe ten more minutes, they would have come up with something far more pertinent because as poets know, we don't have much of a place in society. Um, you know, and it's not something you expect either. Uh, I think the poet's place in society really is a, as a kind of a, as some, it's a, it's a kind of a substitute for what people used to do in churches and temples, which is have a moment of silence and maybe hear something, a kind of an inner voice that helps you be better. But that's not something most people want, you know. You don't want to hear that inner voice very often. So uh, I don't know if society has a place for poets, and I don't know if poets have a place for society, and I'm glad we're not sticking to that as the subject of our conversation today, because if we did, I think we'd be done in about five minutes. Um, what was your question? <laughs> but it's interesting about consciousness because I think poets have historically been such degenerates, you know. I mean, there have been some upstanding poets, but I think by and large they're not sort of the role models of, of how to be as a human being or a good person or moral or when we talk about consciousness seems such a weighty word, but I think what the poem does is different. So the poet is different from the poem, and that, that's an important point. To right, remember. okay. So let's agree to completely move away from that theme. It relieves me of a huge responsibility. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Tishani, this is for you. Um, I think what makes us particularly proud of you is the fact that we think of you as being from here, whatever this <laughs> means, right? Uh, I heard you at your performance, um, at the launch of your book in Madras, of course. There, uh, there is no purity to this, and nor is this purity required. I'm not uh, saying that. I'm thinking also of your poem, Your Body Language is Not Indian. But I'm also equally thinking of your poems, Summer in Madras, and Monsoon Poems, with its lovely references to Kurundagai and other markers that you strew like breadcrumbs, to just borrow your own phrase through your work. Um, could you trace for us the cartography of um, your development, evolution, I don't know what word to use, as a poet, and what has geography meant to you? That's such a great and huge question. Um, I think in terms of the internal geography, I'm so tied to this city um, and to this landscape. 
but as a poet, I became a poet when I was an undergraduate student in the, in the United States. And so the first poets that gave me freedom and emancipation to think that I could even be a poet, to give me permission, were contemporary American poets. People like uh, Mark Doty, James Tate, Mary Oliver. And then, of course, I, I started to read, you know, I was reading Neruda and Rilke, people who had left us but who are always there. And then you sort of realize that, wait a minute, and also Kamla Das, I would say from the Indian poets, Kamla Das was the great poet who I read and my jaw dropped and I thought, oh, you can do this in a poem. Um, but it's, it's strange because we are always trying to re-educate, I mean, to educate ourselves about our own geography in some ways. And in a way, the great thing about being a poet is that you're not tied. But then you think of Derek Walcott writing about the sea, and you think of Seamus Heaney writing about the bogs of Ireland, and, you, and, and Bishop talking about Brazil, and you realize that landscape is inevitable in some ways, and it does come into the poetry. But you also have poets in exile, who are writing about a place that they haven't seen for a long time. So it's very interesting, this, this area of geography. And for me, it's also contained within the body. I feel like being a dancer, it's always sort of the idea of, con you know, my first book was called Countries of the Body. And so for me, it's, it's, it's very close together. This idea in dance, in Bharat Natyam, they teach you that your body is your universe. Don't talk so about Chandraleka now, I have another question. No, 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 <laughs> but just this idea that we contain our geography, we contain the universe, we contain everything. And so that's something that as a poet I think is very powerful because you can, you can go anywhere with it. You know? I, I was uh, really happy to hear what you said about Kamala Das, that you read her first and you thought, wow, you could do that, because I felt exactly the same way the first time I read her, uh, those amazing early poems. Um, and many years later, when I put together uh, the, this anthology, I got in touch with her. Um, and I phoned her in Madras. Uh, she was a kind of a family friend as well. So uh, she was on the phone. At that point, she was much older. This was, a, in fact, a couple of, a few months before she died. And uh, so I asked for permission to publish these poems in this anthology, which became the Blood Axe Book of Contemporary Indian Poets. And of course she said yes immediately. She didn't even ask which, who was publishing it, uh, which poems I wanted. She said just immediately, take whatever you like. And then just before she hung up, she said, uh, apropos of nothing, she said, uh, you know, Jeet, what I miss is uh, the yearning. What I miss about love is the yearning. And then she hung up. Sadaf, um, in your debut collection, Sari Reams, which was published in 2013, right? Um, I found it sort of striking for, what con uh, for the passion with which you have approached what constitutes the everyday in Bangladesh. And you get a sense of, to again use the word, the sense of the geography, the landscape of, of the country, right? Uh, and I'm also thinking of your poem, among this all, which speaks of the contradictions that's life in Bangladesh, not very different from how life is here or how life is anywhere really, right? So would you say that it is these very contradictions, uh, the lack of neatness and the lack of singular narrative that feeds your work? I, I mean, I think that, the, as I sort of said earlier, that it's kind of my response. So I don't believe in a, in a, kind of dogmatic nationalism. Um, but at the same time, I do feel hugely privileged to be in Dhaka now, um, experiencing you know, all the, the paradoxes and uh, the amazing energy, uh, see the amazing resilience of so many people around me, um, the potential and opportunities. And there's something, uh, I grew up in England and many people sort of I'm really surprised that I don't miss it the way, you know, I didn't know Bangladesh until I was 16, and then I went back to university. Um, so it was kind of my way of addressing a sort of rootedness I felt without it, it uh, yeah, it, 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 it being embraced as a kind of nationalism. Um, 
Yeah, so Jeet, this is uh, for you. Um, a lot of readers of your work have uh, talked about, I mean, in conversations, personal conversations with me, that um, it sort of resists easy entry and easy categorization or, or whatever, right? And you have, uh, I think, always been rightly suspicious of uh, uh, narratives that paint, say, the country in, in uh, you know, very clear, um, soft focus, as you say, and, and so on. And you've used the grotesque, you've used other ways of um, talking about your various uh, subjects. And one gets the sense that uh, uh, there is an entire continent, not a neat continent, but it's very collective, dark, messy, underside that informs your work, both in your novels and perhaps a little bit of it seeps into your, uh, into your poetry as well. Uh, there is a sense also of a self that is anchored in its unanchoredness, in a sense, in the va various demons it has had to fight. So I was wondering if you would like to say a little bit about that. Yeah, I absolutely agree about the unanchored self, but I, I would say uh, the area in which my writing self is anchored, um, I have a book of poems, an early book of poems called English. And I would say it's anchored in that river, if it's anchored at all, and which is a river that flows certainly through our country, through every city of this country and of this subcontinent, um, and through the world. Uh, so I, I, th I am happy to hear that there's a sense of, uh, of kind of not being fixed. And I think, you know, it has everything to do with being an, a writer of English in India, uh, especially a writer of English poetry, because for how many years is it now that that's an accusation that people throw at us? Oh, you write in English, you can't be authentic. You know, you write in English, you're you're speaking, you're thinking, you've been colonized uh, by a, a foreign oppressive regime. And the point is, it's our language. And, uh, you know, every time, and I get this from friends as well, who, um, when they want to be really critical or when they want to fight, say, uh, but why don't you read and write in Malayalam? You have the Malayalam ghazal. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a Malayalam, but it's in, it, it is in English. In English yeah. <laughs> and my uh, response is always, yes, I'll get to Malayalam as soon as I've mastered English. And it's just taking a bit longer than I thought it would. <laughs> right, thanks. Um, Tishani, so now this is a Chandraleka question, and thank you for not preempting <laughs> this. Right, so uh, I've been reading some of what you've said about Chandraleka and the uh, maybe the transformative role that she's played in your life. And I always thought about what a stroke of good fortune and grace really it is uh, for one to be touched by a person like Chandra, right? Um, and also, you know, I would like to hear from you how um, Chandra, your dance, your poetry, her dance, her poetry, all that energized each other. Did you ever discuss your poetry with her? Because she also wrote poetry and she was a very good poet and I have her collection, so just curious. I think that, um so the time when I met her, I was 26. Did you meet Dom Moraes when you were 26? Exactly the, that yeah. age. You know, I was, and I was reading this book, uh, Rilke's book. Uh, he, met, he went to Paris and he met Rodin when he was 26. And I think 26 might be the magic age when you receive someone. And I think your life is like you're not a kid and you're trying to become an adult and you're open to a lot of things. And I think it was just that sense of being very open at that age, arriving back home after being away for a long time, meeting this person who then switched me around. Of course, she famously switched a lot of people in all age groups around <laughs> onto different paths, um, which was her particular gift. But I was thinking about um, how uh, an influence can arrive. And then, you know, Jeet's whole, his book is dedicated to Dom and He's there in, in the last book as well. And, th and I think those presences are always there. And so for me, certainly Chandralekha was one of those people. And I don't think I'll have another one in that way because I won't be 26 again, you know? And for me, we talked about everything, about, of course, poetry. The first time I had a poem published in the, in the TLS, I showed it to her. She was alive. She was so happy. And she looked up at the sky and said, you're going to go places. And I said, I hope not up there yet. But <laughs> and, you know, uh, we talked about obviously being a woman, an artist, and painting, and everything. And I think um, 
that relationship was the relationship that allowed me to decide that I wanted to be a writer, you know, in the sense that I had wanted to be a poet, but I had no idea how to do it. So it's a very, um, it stays with you, and even after they're gone, they're kind of these presences. So I, I just, I feel like probably a lot of people have something like that, and for me it was Chandra. Would you like to talk about Dom then, since it came up? That might take a whole other session, but yeah, I mean, I could say very quickly that I feel very blessed to have met him at the time that I did, because at that time I was in Bombay, I was writing poems, I had been there for a few years, but I knew no poets, and I felt completely isolated. And the thing about being that age in that city in the uh, 80s is that you, fe you felt completely outside history and outside literary history. You felt you had been marooned somewhere where you knew no one and no one knew you. And then I met Dom, and uh, unlike the other Bombay poets, all of whose names you know, he was generous. They were not. He was open. They were not. He tried to help young writers. They did not. They shut the doors of their club and didn't allow anybody else in. Dom was never like that. The doors of his home was op were open. The doors of his mind and his heart were open to young writers, always. Same, yeah. Yeah. Sadaf, would you like to talk about an influence like that in your life, perhaps? Uh, well, I kind of felt um, similar to that in Bangladesh, but I think for much longer. Um, I, I, so I didn't really sort of meet anybody that I felt kind of inspired me for po on the sort of poetry front until much later. Uh, and again, um, Said Shamsul Haq is one of our greatest living po poets then, and he passed away last year. Um, and. Uh, he was one of those people, again, who was extremely generous, but I met him much, much later on. Um, but when I was younger, um, uh, you know, I was influenced, you know, with, with write, uh, poets like Sylvia Plath, where I just felt like you could, you could really express what was in you. Um, you could kind of, you know, op you, that, kind of, it, that kind of gave me permission to feel that, you know, everything in you, you could, as a woman, you could actually express it. Um, and that was kind of in the backdrop when everything is around me. It was like, as a woman, you shouldn't express anything. Um, you, you know, you don't want to be insolent. You don't want to be, you know, too smart. You don't want to, you know, all of that kind of stuff is going around you. Um, and even though I was trying to challenge it in many different ways, uh, I think where poetry in, is concerned, because it's so personally exposing yourself, um, I think that was a very difficult time then to sort of expose the personal when you're trying to sort of um, tackle things on many kind of pu on, a, on a public front and you're trying to fight for um, women's rights and entitlements and uh, um, presence in a public, very public sphere. Um, I was wondering do, how much time do we have? Whether we need to... Right. So. Um, Shall we say that we will uh, end the session with a reading from one of your poems, each of you? And then there's some time, I think, for Q&As. This is a poem that was commissioned by a magazine in Delhi, magazine that probably should stay unnamed. But then again, why? IQ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they commissioned a poem, and then when I... They commissioned a poem, they said, and you know, they said they would pay for it, which is always a nice thing to hear when you're a poet, uh, and pay fairly decently, almost as much as you would be paid for prose, uh, but not quite. Uh, so anyway, they commissioned this poem, and I wrote it. Uh, I think it was the first poem I might have written on commission. This was in uh, 2015, and sent it to them, and at which point they said, sorry, we can't publish this. Um, because it's about the Prime Minister and it, it's about the current regime. Uh, and of course I understand, you know, they're journalists, they uh, are closer to fear than most of us. Um, so they said no, and I'm going to read it now because this is how I get, how I get to own that story a little bit. This is called Wapsi. On television, 
the new war blares. We sick bitches lick our wounds and try to recuperate. Cow logic, cowed rhetoric, cowardly assassinations replicate the ways God dons armor in India in 2015. The earth picks at its scabs, old wounds made fresh. Children crawl backward like crabs to the cradle. No light, no progress, only a cleansing of the unclean as defined by the prime minister's fringe masters. His beard drips grammar this morning, and though his fist pumps properly for the camera, he has lost faith in his tryst, his destiny. His own words make him cringe and grieve for the gone world, the great transformation wrought on the past, the sly erasure of names, Nehru, Gandhi, Ambedkar, history recast for the age of holy terror, the tolerant taught to hate. Why measure time with words when word is met with violence? How tame, how lame this line met with silence. How useless its meter and rhyme. Better far to speak to the birds whose voices grow in panic or pity as man's horizon narrows with his understanding and the sun shrinks to a tight band of porous saffron loud enough to stun even him, the silent, all-seeing deity. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a poem I actually uh, wrote a few months ago. I uh, think we're all desensitized by the TV uh, images of refugees pouring into Europe. Uh, and then more recently, uh, I myself have been talking to uh, the Rohingya people who've come across the border into Bangladesh. Um, but this is when I was, I guess, faced with my own mortality in the sense of uh, something I hope will never ever have to happen to me. Aborted. My pen freezes with ink pressing longhand on crisp, thick page. Thoughts sieved through mindful edits could bring death or its shadow hovering. Words escape, revealing my truths. Will it be that I am teleported to a faraway land where I have no wish to be? Exhausted, a struggling migrant community rebuilding fragments of a life. Through boats, containers, ports, high seas, jetties, danger, camps, bureaucracies, shoved, cordoned, isolated, interrogated, frozen, battered, near drowned, embattled, refused, denied entry, movement. Seeking refuge, beggars of abode. Or just walk in via that coveted red or blue passport, an immigrant bearing disintegrated dignities, truncated memories, castrated histories pouring my potency and strength to this new land where I am pitied, despised, justified, leaving the old betrothed to vultures as I metamorphose into a statistic. I start anew. Um. And I'll read uh, the title poem of the collection, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods. Girls are coming out of the woods, wrapped in cloaks and hoods, carrying iron bars and candles and a multitude of scars collected on acres of premature grass and city buses 
in temples and bars. Girls are coming out of the woods with panties tied around their lips, making such a noise it's impossible to hear. Is the world speaking too? Is it really asking what does it mean to give someone a proper resting? Girls are coming out of the woods, lifting their broken legs high, leaking secrets from unfastened thighs. All the lies whispered by strangers and swimming coaches and uncles, especially uncles who said spreading would be light and easy, who put bullets in their chests and fed their pretty faces to fire, who sucked the mud clean off their ribs and decorated their coffins with briar. Girls are coming out of the woods, clearing a ground to scatter their stories. Even those girls found naked in ditches and wells, those forgotten in neglected attics and buried in riverbeds like sediments from a different century. They've crawled their way out from behind the curtains of childhood, the silver pink weight of their bodies pushing against water, against the sad, feathered tarnish of remembrance. Girls are coming out of the woods the way birds arrive at morning windows, pecking and humming, until all you can hear is the smash of their minuscule hearts against glass the bright desperation of sound, bashing, disappearing. Girls are coming out of the woods. They're coming. They're coming. Thank you. So time maybe for a quick couple of questions, and we'll have to wrap up. Yes. Uh, generally, poems are written for uh, reading only. What about poems for singing, for dance, for different musical instruments, for different uh, ragas. And uh, there is a lot of scope uh, for applicability of uh, poems in different areas, different professions. Uh, unfortunately, they write only prose poems. Most of them are only prose poems also. They don't have any exposure. The poets don't have exposure. They don't uh, uh, work so with the profession so with other uh, just team. Let the poets answer. So that's like why the, the it has a very limited. Uh, that's why we don't find audience. So what's the question? Uh, the question is: She raised. Uh, there is no audience. We cannot find audience. Audience oh. are there, but with the different needs, we must uh, re according to their needs. They have to write. Right. They okay. cannot uh, impose force something on the audience. No, no, no. Everyone's free to be. But here they have to do a lot of homework. Uh, without homework. Because they knew some language okay. that they start writing. Can we move on to some And uh, in the long question? run, uh, nothing is uh, useful else? to the society. Thank you. But you're here, sir. And these people are here. So we do have an audience. <laughs> yes. Uh, we look upon poets as those who have a very hyper uh, deep understanding of the human condition. Some time ago, there was an anthology of Taliban poetry, and there was a lot of opposition to that. that. So do we only allow those who subscribe to a certain thinking to be poets, and those who perform violent acts are to be deli denied the agency of poetry? In fact, uh, there's a book of poems by Narendra Modi. And I'm very surprised you don't know this book. It's by our great leader, and the poems are absolutely something. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a wrap now. That's what their board says. Thank you all for coming here, and thanks to all of you for sharing your thoughts.